What's up, everybody? Thanks for coming to join and hang out with us and talk about this case today. Um, some really interesting documents to me on uh, what makes YouTube discussions on these cases so cool and so interesting is that we get to learn so many different things in real life cases that a, you probably don't learn in law school or any kind of schooling, and B, you would never know unless you were following cases like this, and C, you can really test some news headlines when you break down what the actual court documents are saying and what's going on in these different situations. So we're going to talk about this jury tampering, is the fix in, is Koberger's team out there doing shady things, trying to taint the potential jury pool, trying to figure this out in a way that forces a change of venue or... Um, forces people to see it his way. And that's what we're going to discuss today through all of these um, court documents. So make sure you guys hit the like button if you haven't already. Make sure you're subscribed to our page. Hit that subscribe button. Take the second to do that because that's how you'll be alerted about this case and so many others that we're covering. Chad Daybell's trial is starting very soon. There's this river stabbing trial that people have been sending to me. Let me know if you guys are watching that or have questions on that. Uh, maybe that's something we'll discuss in the future. But today we're focusing in back on Brian Koberger. So here is the first order that kind of sent everybody into a tizzy because as many things in this case, a lot of it was done under seal. So we didn't get to see a lot of it. We didn't get to read a lot of it. We didn't get to hear a lot of it. But we did get this order prohibiting contact with prospective jurors until further order of the court. On March 22nd, the state filed a sealed motion for order prohibiting further contact with prospective jurors absent leave of the court. The same day, Brian Koberger filed an objection with the promise of a forthcoming affidavit and memorandum in support of that objection. Having reviewed the documents, the court has decided that both parties are prohibited from contacting potential jurors about this case, including via third parties, until further order by the court. And we're going to have a hearing on this very soon. Very, very soon. So I like the way the court did this, right? to try and calm the media frenzy. He says both sides cannot contact potential jurors. Now it's clear the state is the one that filed the original motion. So the media kind of ran with that and that Koberger was trying to contact potential jurors. Was he trying to tamper? What was he trying to do? We don't really know the answer, but the judge did not come down on hard on Koberger. So that should indicate to you right there, there's probably no wrongdoing, but the court did tell everybody to stop contacting potential jurors. Okay. And again, we only have some of these documents because some are still um, under seal. Maybe that'll change. But let's look at this. This is the memorandum in support of the objection to the state's motion for order prohibiting contact with prospective jurors absent leave of the court. So this is Koberger's argument, at least part of it, as to why he should be able to contact potential jurors. Not just that, oh, he wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't contacting potential jurors. That he was and should continue to be able to. And this was not a surprise to the state. They already knew this. They knew he was going to do this. Koberger, through his lawyer, says that telephonic surveys to, in, to explore the media stories the juror population has been exposed to is not a violation of the court's revised order issued on June 23rd, 2023. The state has alleged that the defense has violated the court's revised order. Specifically, the state alleges the defense has violated uh, the prohibition on discussing the identity or nature of evidence expected to be presented at trial or any sentencing phase of the proceeding. The order also prohibits the disclosure of any information a lawyer knows or reasonably knows is likely to be admissible evidence in trial, and that would, if disclosed, create a substantial risk of prejudicing an impartial trial. The defense is aware of these prohibitions. After all, the defense wrote the original order upon which it was based. So they're saying, hey, we know it because we wrote it. The state, however, misunderstands the prohibition in this respect. The defense is not disclosing information. The defense is asking prospective jurors in the county of Latah as to what information they are aware of that was previously disclosed vis-a-vis -vis the press. Further, the revised order for non-dissemination allows for counsel to ask questions of the public to do its work. That is exactly what happened. So what's going on here? The defense, and that's why the court mentioned via a third party in the prior order, the defense via a third party 
is taking surveys and reaching out to prospective jurors in Latah County. Why are they doing that? Well, we all know that they have filed a motion for a change of venue. And we know that you can't just say that it's a poison jury pool or we need more jurors. You have to actually prove that there are issues, that jurors have made up their mind, that there's a tainted jury pool, there's not enough jurors. They've seen the media reports. They already think he's guilty before the trial even starts. That is what the defense is doing. And that is what defense attorneys do in lots of cases. Now, sometimes they can't do it because they don't have the resources or the funds or the time to do it. It would be nice to do in every case, but especially when you think you have a legitimate argument for a change of venue. Joanne says, is a survey okay? So in a lot of situations, yes, this is okay. Ashley, it's, I don't know if I'd say it's common, but it's not uncommon. It absolutely happens. Uh, Bear Siren. Who are potential jurors, the public, the, the members of Latah County, people that could, I always say you guys are potential jurors or prospective jurors in the county in which you live. So if you live in Latah County, that's who they are targeting and asking these questions. No, it's not Koberger himself. It would be agents on behalf of his attorney. So not something out of the order, not something crazy. Mr. Koberger, in his preparation for his change of venue hearing, is mindful of what the court must consider and the available means to obtain information for this evidentiary hearing. Idaho Criminal Rule 21 and relevant case law guide the factors a court must consider in a motion to change venue. The state's motion and the court's order intrudes on one of the ways the defense will seek to establish prejudice pursuant to ICR 21A. Um... The Idaho Court of Appeals, and it outlines relevant factors the court must consider when taking a change of venue, extensive publicity, the accuracy of the publicity, that's a big one in this case, and the size of the community from which the jury should be drawn. The Haddon Court, in referencing the size of the county as being small, said, however, this fact alone does not require the presumption of prejudice, nor would such a rule be practicable given the relatively rural nature of many of Idaho's counties. The Haddon Court also said, had a sorry, also said a party challenging the venue must bring more than the size of the community. Certainly, pervasive media coverage that continues to this day is a factor and will be discussed in a later filing. The focus here is on the critical survey work, obtaining information to support the change of venue motion by establishing the more in addition to the size of the community. This important work will establish the reasonable probability of prejudice. To provide that more, the defense has hired Dr. Brian Edelman owner of Trial Innovations. He has experience as doctor of psychology, um, and he's the one that has cognitive things that say um, what that more really is. And the survey, to be valid, must be done at a random selection of contacts. The number of surveys are small, but enough to see trends that are attributed to a larger population. And we're going to look at his declaration, just a couple pages of it. It's attached to this motion. The questions in the survey seek limited but important information. To qualify, the surveyor first asks if the person reached is an adult Latah County resident. That is the pool of people that we're looking for, okay? Love, we're gonna talk about some of the questions we think they're asking. They tell us some, but we can kind of figure out some others as well as we continue to read. Um, once he figures that out, then, he's, then the survey continues with opinion, exposure, and connection to the case questions. So, do they have an opinion on the case? What is their exposure? Have they looked at media articles? Do they already have an opinion on the case? Do they know about the case? If they do, what do they know about the case? Those are the kinds of questions. His extensive research of the media coverage in this case with the approval of counsel is designed um, the media influence questions around statements that have been in the media. So they're not giving new information. Instead, they're focusing on information that's already been given in the media. As counsel for the state wrote in their motion, many of the media influence questions are not factually correct. That's exactly the point. So they're both saying the same thing. The media is giving out information that is not correct. And that's part of the problem, but it doesn't change the fact that those are some of the questions they're asking about. Even if it's something incorrect, if a juror has read it or a potential juror has read it and thinks it's true, that could be vital information to help us figure out if we can find a fair and impartial jury in Latah County. Uh, that is what the Haddon Court said in relation to extensive media coverage. Non-factual media dissemination is more harmful. It would be of little use to this court to know that there was a deluge of unobjectionable media coverage. 
The only way for this court to have a way of understanding what the parties would face with a juror from Latah County is to know what they are being exposed to. As Dr. Edelman can testify, that is the sort of work parties do in these cases. It may be new to some in Latah County, but it is still the industry standard, professional and ethical way to do this work. I agree with them. Now, the court has stopped it and there are things under seal, so we don't know everything. But generally speaking, work similar to this has been approved in other jurisdictions. I'll just put it that way. There is no realistic possibility that this will affect the jury selection in Latah County. I'm not so sure about that. The problems with this county are not of the defense's making. They are what the defense wishes to expose to the court. Okay? And then they just make an conclusion where they kind of repeat what they said in summary. So, to me, to me, it is absolutely possible that the defense team is calling prospective jurors and saying, you know he's not guilty, you know he didn't do it, you know the media is lying, and if that's the case, there's a major problem. But just because they're doing these surveys, just because they're reaching out, just because they're asking about media and opinions on the case, doesn't mean they're actually affecting the jury or fixing the jury or doing anything wrong. So that's what we're trying to figure out here is what exactly is asked. I'm sure the court can get some information. Some of these people apparently have reached out to the prosecutor's office. That's probably how they found out about it. So let's jump down. This is his, the declaration made by uh, Dr. Brian Edelman. We're going to jump down here to when he talks about the telephonic survey here. A telephone survey of 400 residents was conducted in Latah County. The sample size of 400 was calculated via a power analysis to reach an industry standard 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 5% using the most conservative response distribution, 50%. Comparison surveys were planned in two alternative counties to assess if any potential bias found in Latah carried over to the rest of the state. Because that's one of the questions the judge had, and a lot of people, myself included, think that this isn't going to be an issue that's limited to Latah County. Well, they planned on doing additional surveys, but were stopped based on this court order. The survey instrument used in this case adheres to standard to industry standards established by the American Association of Public Opinion Research and the change of venue survey professional code established by the American Society of Trial Consultants. The survey instrument, topics of focus, and questions were constructed after reading more than 269 articles that reference the murders in Moscow. Very interesting. So they're reading through all the media. They're doing all their research. They're seeing what everybody else has talked about. I see people mentioning some media influencers there in the chat. They're trying to look into all that so they can ask the right question to say, do you watch Nancy Grace? Do you watch Law and Crime? Do you watch this or that? What do you read? And what have you seen there? All of the questions in the survey, including the media recognition items criticized by the government, were carefully selected based on how pervasive each item was in the coverage. So we know now that the government has criticized some of the questions or the items. We don't know which ones. None of the media recognition items included any information that was not widely reported and available in public domain. And that's important because they're not divulging any new information. They're not violating the non-dissemination order, according to them, of course. Um, none of the media recognition items were, okay. The rest of the survey instrument focused on the respondents' opinions of the defendant, prejudgment, experiences during the search for a suspect, the survey measure, measured the residents' exposure to media coverage, the, the extent of their case knowledge and their opinions regarding the case. So nothing specific, but it gives us some general buckets that these questions came from. The survey was conducted by Research Strategies, Inc., a consumer, public opinion, and business-to-business -business market research firm for 36 years. Their data has been used in 49 districts, federal district courts, and U.S. Department of Justice. They are they programmed the screener and survey into the Research Strategy, Inc. Proprietary Computer Program Research Express. Okay, so here they're just saying they did it all the right way. Uh, respondents who refused to participate were not called again. That's good. That's important. They're not forcing people to talk. To successfully win a change of venue motion, the defendant needs to demonstrate that the media coverage has generated bias in the community that undermines his or her constitutional right to a fair and impartial trial. The standard method for measuring prejudgment and fixed opinions within a venue is a community attitude survey. So that is what they're doing here. That is what this company is built on. That is what they do. There is no other accepted scientific method for doing so. By preventing the defendant from completing the survey, the government is impeding his ability to collect the data required to meet his burden. This is obviously a defense expert, so he's going to be biased for the defense. 
Will the government then criticize the change of venue motion for failing to demonstrate widespread, widespread bias and fix opinions in Lake Talk County? A couple things here. So number one, he's trying to put pressure on the judge. The defense is trying to put pressure on the judge saying, we need to do this. If we don't do this, you can't tell us we don't have enough information about the residents because this is how we would have found that information. But how do we do this in other cases? When a defendant maybe can't afford this or isn't afforded the um, resources Brian Koberger and his team are afforded. Well, we do it during jury selection. When we bring everybody out and they're like, yeah, we're all biased. We're like, see, judge, we're all biased. We tried to pick these jurors and we couldn't. But that's not the only way. And I do think the judge will consider this and that's why he's put a pause on it for now, but they're going to have a hearing on it. The survey design methodology I used in this case comports with the surveys I have presented in numerous other cases, which other courts have found to be valid and objective when considering the need to change venue. For example, and he gives some other uh, quite, uh, examples where the court said, Dr. Edelman, appealed, Dr. Edelman appeared to use a measured objective analysis of the basis of change of venue. Other courts said he's an experienced expert in the area of change of venue. Okay. So he's like, look at how great I am, judge, which I don't, I don't blame him. That's what experts are supposed to do. The notion that polling 400 community resident, residents, 1% of Latah County population, 18 and over, is the cause of potential bias in a county that has been saturated with hundreds of highly prejudicial newspaper articles, television news stories, and social media posts is not credible. I agree with him there. Do you guys agree? I mean, with all the media that's out there worldwide, I don't think them taking a survey of 400 residents to see what they know, what they think, if they've already formed opinions, is going to poison the jury pool. Unlike the media, individual residents do not serve as a communication channel for disseminating information across the county. There is no evidence that the that conducting the survey has an impact on the master list of prospective jurors or potential venire in this case. The survey in Latah County has already been completed. It is my opinion, unless the government is willing to concede the point and waive the issue, that it is necessary to complete the comparison surveys in alternate venues. Well, if it's alternate venues, then it's even less likely to affect the jury because they're not going to be picking the jury from there unless they change venue, of course. This is the only method for demonstrating that there are counties in Idaho that are significantly less biased against the defendant than Lata County. Very interesting. Rebecca's been a member for a year. It's awesome. She's bringing uh, five members with her now to start their hopefully full year of membership. So very interesting. They brought the goods with their expert. So the next document we're going to look at is the defense's uh, motion to rescind the order for failure to provide due process. Late Friday afternoon, the state filed this case. They were well aware of the survey long before their filing on March 22nd. Um, they were aware prior to March 8th, even by the time the parties met on March 21st, the state had at least one transcript of the survey. They knew the questions that were asked. So this wasn't a surprise. They tried to clear this stuff with the state. They tried to keep everything as above board as possible. That's why the state was even able to object to this and talk about this. The defense provided the CV of the expert. They informed the state um, that they were doing this, that this was common practice. The surveys such as these meet the standards of care required of the defense in a capital case. They're meaning like what they're saying there is we have to do this. As the defense team, we have to do this or else we're not doing our job appropriately in a capital case. Unfortunately, though, it's letter writing to the court, the state achieved previous, has achieved previous action from the court without Koberger receiving due process. The state knew what it was doing when it filed it late afternoon motion with attachments. Koberger quickly filed an objection, stated further information would be coming. The court has issued an order halting the defense work without giving Mr. Koberger any opportunity to be heard. This is a violation of Mr. Koberger's constitutional rights pursuant to the 14th Amendment, uh, which is due process. Opportunity to be heard at a meaningful time in a meaningful manner in order to satisfy due process. They're saying they didn't get that in this case. At a bare minimum, there must be some process to ensure that the individual is not arbitrarily deprived of his rights. Uh, for the court to take action without ensuring Mr. Koberg had an opportunity to be heard stops the defense from preparing to meet its deadline for filing in its support and motion to change a venue. Can I tell you what is going to follow this? I would be willing to bet that at some point in the future, we will be hearing from the defense that this caused a delay and they may not be ready for trial. They may not have their change of venue motion ready because the court has caused this delay or the state and the court together has caused this delay, especially if later after a hearing, the court says, actually, yes, you can do this survey for the other two counties. 
because they're saying they didn't give him due process. Happened in the middle of the night, basically, and the court granted the motion. Netwoman, thank you for gifting 10 memberships. She's back with the goods. All right. Next, let's hear from the state a little bit. Let's hear what the state has to say. Some things that are not sealed. Objection to the defendant's motion to rescind the order for failure to provide due process. State objects. The defendant's factual recitation in support of his motion leaves much to be desired. Does that mean he lied or he wasn't true or they left out very important things? Leaving out critical facts that are fatal to his argument, most glaringly. The defense fails to even mention this court's revised amended non-dissemination order, which the court entered more than six months ago, briefing the parties and oral argument. As relevant here, the non-dissemination order prohibits certain out-of-court statements, including out-of-court statements that relate to the identity or nature of evidence expected to be presented at trial or any sentencing phase of the proceeding. On March 8th, more than six months after, the state received information from a Lake Talk County resident who received an unsolicited telephone survey regarding this case. So I'm not sure, did the defense give it to them or did the resident give it to them? Because the state's making it sound like the resident gave it to them. The defense made it sound like they shared the information with them. The state had little information about the call at that point and did not yet have reason to believe the defense had violated the non-dissemination order. By March 19th, however, the state had learned that multiple other, sounds like 400, Lake Talk County residents had been called and learned the callers were disclosing information about evidence that would be presented at trial. So that's an interesting accusation. Did they actually uh, reveal or divulge evidence that would be shared at trial? Or did they say, have you seen this news article that said there's DNA on the knife sheet? That's not revealing evidence. That's just talking about something in the media. So that's kind of tough to deal with and parse through. Equipped with this new information, the state had a serious concern about the defense violating the non-dissemination order, giving the defense the benefit of the doubt. They decided to contact defense counsel prior to raising the issue with the court. Defense confirmed that the calls were being made on their behalf, so I guess it came from the resident and the defense. State expressed its concern and informed the defense that it needed to be raised with the court. State filed a motion seeking an order prohibiting further contact, um, and the court granted it. Defense filed an objection same day that conceded the defense had conducted such a survey. With a memorandum in support, which we read, the court then entered the order prohibiting each party, either party from contacting the respective jurors. So technically that could be considered due process since the de defense was able to respond. The court states that it reviewed materials submitted by both parties. A hearing on the issue be ha handled as soon as practicable. The court has now scheduled the hearing for April 4th, which is in two days, less than two weeks after. So at a max, it's less than a two-week de uh, delay. Uh, this fuller explanation of the facts demonstrates that this court provided the defendant due process. Due process is satisfied when the court is provided with notice and opportunity to be heard, which is exactly what the defense say. They just don't think a rushed response by them was really appropriate. They want more time to respond appropriately. It's not a concept to be applied rigidly. Due process is a flexible concept calling for such procedural protections as are warranted by the particular situation. Isn't that great of the state? They're like, eh. Due process. They got due process. Come on. This court has, compiled, has complied with due process on this issue by providing the defense notice and opportunity to be heard at every stage of the case. Early in this case, the defense stipulated the non-dissemination order. They even drafted it. And then the defense uh, briefed and argued it. Okay, we discussed that already. This court did allow the defense to be heard. Okay, that's the state's first response. But we've got more from the state. We've got more. Here is a declaration. Let's talk about some stat, uh, some facts the state wants to declare. All right. On March 8th, they received information from the resident, which we already know. Several days later, um, they forwarded it to the Moscow Police Department. During the time between, they became aware of other individuals. We already know this. Uh, became suspected that an unsolicited telephonic survey was happening. That's correct. Uh, defense counsel affirmed it. I'm trying to get to the part. Here we go. They expressed uh, concern 
They explained their concerns. They told Ms. Taylor that their office felt this information needed to be brought to the court's attention. They proposed sending a letter to the court attaching copies. Ms. Taylor expressed concern regarding this procedure, indicating she would want to respond prior to the court ruling. So they then discussed an alternate method by filing a motion. Ms. Taylor again expressed concern, saying they needed an actual hearing. We explained that a motion with supporting documentation is standard practice. So this, again, doesn't look great for Ann Taylor because this is saying they told her what was going to happen. They said, let's just write an informal letter. She said, no, I want to respond. So they said, okay, then we're going to file a motion you can respond to, which is what they did. And she responded. So she made it sound like they didn't give her the opportunity. They kind of did in the normal way of doing things. The court did issue a quick order, which he's done a million times in this case. And due process and opportunity to be heard does not always mean a hearing. Now the court is setting a hearing and he did it without delay. So I don't feel like Brian Koberger's due process was violated in this situation, even if the court does allow the surveys, which I think there is an argument to allow surveys like this. So the state wanted to just declare that, let the court know um, what happened and that they did discuss this before with Ann Taylor. She didn't want it to be an informal letter. She wanted to respond to a motion. That's exactly what happened. And therefore, her due process rights were, in fact, not violated. All right. Next up. All right. This is the last one. This is a reply in support of the motion for order prohibiting contact with the prospective jurors absent to leave court. This is always the best kind of uh, motion to write. Judge, we agree with you. Good job. We think you made the right decision. And here is why. All right, first, the defendant's explanation of how the survey complies with the non-dissemination order does not withstand even the slightest scrutiny. The defendant argues that hiring a professional firm to contact uh, prospective jurors in Latah County and ask questions embedded with specific facts from the case does not violate the non-dissemination order because the embedded facts were already disclosed by the media. So that's one of the big questions here. And I kind of think that disclosing facts that are already clearly in the media is not violating the non-dissemination order, especially not coming from the attorneys themselves. If she called and said, hey, this is Ann Taylor. I represent Brian, Brian Koberger. Let's talk about the facts. That's very different than somebody saying, hey, I'm with Innovated Trial Works, and we have a few questions about the Koberger trial. I don't even think they have to tell them that they work for the defense. If the state wants them to, they can, but nothing is colored if they're asking specifically about the case, if they're asking about facts that are already out in the media, if they're asking about if people have already formed opinions, if they're asking about how much media they've seen, have they been affected by it? That is all incredibly important information, and that's actually how you figure out if there is a tainted jury pool or not. But with respect to both attorneys and their agents, the non-dissemination order prohibits any out-of-court statement which a reasonable person <coughs> would expect to be disseminated by means of public communication that relates to several categories of information, including the identity or nature of evidence expected to be presented at trial or any sentencing phase of the proceeding. So would you expect DNA evidence on the sheath to be there? Yes. Would you expect the white Hyundai information to be a trial? Yes. So I get it. There is part of this that what they're disclosing is expected to be discussed or used at trial. I think that's absolutely something we can expect. But is it new information that's being disseminated or disclosed? Or are they asking if they've seen certain things in the media? This is why some sealed documents make it difficult to break down exactly what's going to happen. But it seems like maybe they'll be backing off the ceiling, having this um, argument and hearing hopefully in open court so we'll be able to watch it and see exactly why the judge um, made his decision, why and what 
is being asked, what information is being found, and maybe they'll give the judge a little indication like we saw in Murdoch, right? We've seen this play out where Murdoch provided a chart where everybody already thought he was guilty. Go figure, since half the world watched him admit his financial crimes on the stand during the murder trial. It's like, yeah, we all think he's guilty of the financial crimes. They got that information, presented it to the judge to show why they can't pick an unbiased jury. So if Koberger could have found something similar that because of all the media reports, everybody already thinks he's guilty, well, that's a pretty big piece of evidence for them to change venue in this case. Uh, where was I? Defendant's interpretation that his attorneys and their agents can discuss with prospective jurors anything the media is already discussing would eviscerate the non-dissemination order. Well, that's kind of the point, right? The point was to calm everything down. So much media. We don't want all this stuff talking about it. It is the lawyers and their agents, but it makes a big difference if the person they're talking to knows it's an agent of the lawyer or not. Don't you think? If I was representing somebody and I told you something, I think that means more coming from the horse's mouth, as they say, versus, you know, Joe Schmo over here that, they don't even know if they have a connection with the defense, right? I mean, that's kind of the issue here is what, what is really violating the non-dissemination order and what is not if this information is already out there. Nor can the defendant credibly use as cover that the survey is asking questions rather than making statements. The mere fact that the identity or nature of evidence is being presented to the prospective jurors in the form of a question does not bring the survey into compliance with the non-dissemination order. The specificity of the facts included in the questions implies to the prospective jurors that there is something to see here. Interesting. I would love to read the questions. Undoubtedly, such questions would draw quick ob objections in the voir dire process. Oh, so maybe the defense is pushing the line a little too far here. Uh, the defense, the defendant also badly asserts, always nice to throw that in there, that the non-dissemination order expressly allows the conduct in which his attorneys and agents have engaged, but he fails to quote or even cite the portion of the non-dissemination order he believes authorizes his conduct. The state's best guess is that the defendant is referencing paragraph two and subparagraph E, which allows the attorneys and their agents to request assistance from the public in obtaining evidence and information necessary to the state's case or to, to the defendant's case. I think that's a pretty good argument. Clearly, however, that subparagraph is a reference to general requests made to the public to obtain evidence or information about the case. Like, have you seen anybody else driving this white Hyundai? Have you, do you have any other information of the, about the case? If you were a witness, please reach out. That's what they're trying to say as opposed to, have you seen this? Would you be tainted? Do you already think he did it? This is an interesting one. I could see this one going either way. Honestly, I'm interested to see what the judge is going to actually decide on this. For example, the attorneys or their agents could put out a statement indicating they're looking for any person who were present at X location on Y date. Nothing in subparagraph E authorizes the attorneys and their agents to target prospective jurors and share with them specific facts about the case. What's funny is they're saying we're going to guess what arguments the defense are making without the defense necessarily making that argument and figuring out which part of the non-dissemination order they're really trying to fit this into. And then in the same breath, they say, the defense is making an attack on an argument that the state has not even made, which is kind of what they just did, right? They just attacked an argument that the state or that the defense hasn't even made. <clears throat> Much of the defendant's memorandum and the entirety of the affidavit submitted with the memorandum are under an attack on an argument that the state has not made. The memorandum and affidavit go to great lengths to explain to this court that as a general matter, jury surveys are not inherently improper for the purposes of change of venue motion. So the state agrees that generally speaking, they are not improper. The state has not taken that a contrary position, okay? So the state is saying, we are not even saying that, oh, you can't do these surveys, you can't ask these questions, you can't talk to these people, you can't get this information. They're like, we did not say that. Instead, the sole legal basis for the state's motion is that in this particular case, this court's non-dissemination order prohibits certain questions the defendant's attorneys and agents chose to include in the survey. So what does this all boil down to? Why is this the last document we're going to read? Well, the state is saying in some cases that might be okay, but in this case it's not. 
Not every case has a non-dissemination order, but this case does. We have to live with the court's orders. We can't violate the court's orders. And guess what? You could have created a survey that was allowable under the non-dissemination order in this case. You could have done a survey appropriate for this case. But instead, you didn't. You chose to put in questions you knew or should have known were going to violate the non-dissemination order. Now, is that true? I don't know. I haven't read the questions. But that's what it boils down to, and that's what the state's saying. The state is not arguing against all surveys, all time. You can't talk to any prospective jurors or it's jury tampering or trying to fix the jury. It's not what they're saying, and they make that clear at the end of this motion. Given the state's, this court's, and at least up until this point, defendants' agreement that the non-dissemination order plays a vital role in protecting the integrity of trial, the state filed its motion to bring this matter to the court's attention. So what do we expect to hear at this hearing in two days? I expect the defense to have to argue why this doesn't violate the non-dissemination order. I expect the state to agree that generally this is okay, and they understand why the defense might need this information when they're arguing against the change or they're arguing for a change of venue, why this information could be really important, and maybe they should do it that way, but not in this case because of the court's non-dissemination order. And from my perspective, the court is going to have to look at his non-dissemination order, look at these questions, and make a determination as to whether or not these questions violate the non-dissemination order. Because if they do, the court's not going to allow it. If they don't, the court may allow it. What I expect to happen is the court to allow some kind of survey. Maybe he won't allow certain questions. Maybe he will. They already have the information from the Latah County jurors, which is interesting. So there's no real harm or foul. Why not allow the same questions? In my opinion, I mean, if I was the judge, I don't know what the questions are. If the questions are really bad, then I wouldn't allow it to go forward. But if the questions were not that bad and we already have the answers from Latah County, I kind of want the same apples to apples comparison with the other counties. So I'll have to wait and see exactly how this went. Bodie, Peter, how else could they determine too much bias in the county? Right. I think the point is they could do surveys that don't ask certain questions that they have a problem with. And also, um, they could just do it at voir dire, which is not perfect. Ranger fan, member for one year, one month, and 19 days. That's awesome. Tom, Peter, in my opinion, choose the Constitution over emotions every time. Sounds like the survey, if done properly, meets the constitutional muster. Your thoughts? Uh, thank you for all you do for us. Yes, Tom, I saw you say later I answered your question, but I think the point being is that nobody's arguing you can never do the survey, but you have to do the survey the right way. Every case is individual and is a case-by-case -case basis that comes from the law. And this case has specific requirements. This case has spe specific issues in the media. This case is a death penalty case. So we have to make sure the survey is tailored specifically for this case. Thank you, Tom. Tina asked, uh, Peter, how long can the defense delay a trial? Joseph said, is this, or this is Ann Taylor stalling. So again, the defense can delay the, the uh, trial as much as they can in order to fully and properly prepare. Thank you, Azam, for gifting a membership. Uh, Riri, it's more exposure to third parties about the jury. How do they know if they've already heard the information being asked? Well, they could say, no, I've never heard that. I mean, if I asked you if you've heard something before, I think you would probably know. And if they say it, you say, that sounds kind of familiar. I'm not positive. They take that, down that information. So that's kind of the only way we can really ask, right? How do you ask somebody if they've heard something? You ask them. Netwoman, thank you so much for gifting 10 more memberships. Uh, Snooks asks, is it unusual for the defense to do this without permission of the court and input from the prosecutor? Yes. Also, isn't this a bit premature? The trial's over a year out. No, the court actually almost solicited this information and wants this information. He didn't say to do it this way, but they've been putting off the motion to change venue to wait till they get more information. Gene Taylor, if people are asked about the case, does that eliminate them from being on the jury? No, no, it does not. Word sleuth, does it matter that at least 30% of the jury in this case would most likely be University of Idaho faculty and staff where the victims attended the school? So 
30% of, I assume you mean the potential jury pool. I don't know that that's true. I'll take your word for it. Um, it may, they may all be struck or maybe they're new staff, right? If somebody came after the fact and they don't know anything about it, maybe they would be okay. So I think it's just going to be on a case by case basis. I don't think they're just going to blanket strike everybody that's on staff at, at university of Idaho. Rebecca, thank you for gifting, um, 10 more memberships. Uh, Debbie, will the prosecution get the info from the surveys to fact check? I think that's something they can request and the court will determine if it's something they have to turn over. In my opinion, it's something I think should be disclosed. The defense may argue it's work product, but I think it's something that the, that, that the prosecution has every right to. Azam, are they doing the survey to support their change of venue motion? Yes. So how do you prove there's bias? How do you prove we can't pick a fair and impartial jury? Well, you ask the potential jurors. And if they tell you you can't find a fair and impartial jury, if they tell you they're biased, you start to you start to get your answer. Matt, wouldn't fact residents gone direct to prosecutors kind of prove the point? And to get MPD involved, come on. Also question if the one who recorded the call, do they record all calls? Was it partial? I mean, I get where you're going at here, right? You're you're getting at the fact that people are already against Brian Koberger. They already, you know, think the prosecutors and law enforcement got it right. And that's, you can't, you can't be a juror if that's what you think. So I get where you're coming from here. And if you sit in that pew and you're getting asked questions because you're a potential juror and you say, I kind of just trust the prosecutor and the law enforcement. I think they're right. I don't really trust you. You can't be a juror. You would be struck for cause. The judge would not allow you to sit as a juror. Netwoman, I'm sorry if you said this before. How early were these surveys or polls conducted before trial? I think they were just done recently. Won't most people's memories be diminished by that time anyway? Thanks again for all your content on your third job here. So honestly, to me, um, it, it comes down to the fact that memories will fade, but some people really are dug in on their position. They really are. And if you're dug in on your position, no matter how long it's been, it's going to be really hard to change your mind. That's not what the judicial system is about. That is not a defense attorney's job is not to change your mind from thinking their client is guilty. Uh, Riley said, shouldn't the court ask the potential jurors? So the court will be talking to potential jurors as part of the voir dire process. If you want to see how it's done in Idaho, Chad Daybell's jury selection is going on right now. We're going to do a video on it later this week, but the judge is asking a lot of questions. I assume it's going to be similar in this courtroom. So the judge will have the opportunity, but this is to try to get them the information before we waste time trying to pick a jury here where we know we can't pick one. Shawnee said, thank you for covering all this. I'm understanding this much better now. Yeah, I can understand why it's confusing. And a lot of people reached out to me on Twitter over the last, you know, since March 22nd saying, what's going on? What are they talking about? Is he tampering with the jury? How? Why? Why is the court cutting him off? So I wanted to break it down. That's kind of the whole point of this channel, right? That's the whole point of this channel is to talk to people about legal issues. We can learn about the law together, the criminal and civil justice system together. I am a full-time real practicing lawyer, so I can't do it for as many hours every single day as I'd love to, because I know all the questions are happening, but I do love being a lawyer too. So I can't say it's, it's, uh, I'm not doing something else that I love. And I've met so many people here through YouTube. A lot of you guys have become my clients through YouTube, which is cool too. Um, you know, we don't, we don't handle a lot of cases, um, that are quite like this. Most of what we do is personal injury, wrongful death, trucking accidents, car accident cases, but we do handle a select few criminal cases. Still, my dad's a big time criminal defense attorney. Um, he has a much smaller caseload than he did in his prime. Um, but we are still in the weeds here in criminal defense and um, civil trial law. So that's why I love to learn about this stuff. I love to look at what's cutting edge, what's happening today in the court system, not just in my case, not just in my state, but all over the country. And you guys bring the craziest legal questions, the toughest legal arguments, and we get to watch lawyers make those arguments and judges make decisions, which is awesome because we all get to learn together and break it down and discuss it. Um, is this, is this survey shady? I don't know. Surveys generally are not. This is okay. You can do things like this, but is this one shady? Did they try to slip in some questions? Did they try to affect some of the jurors' minds? I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully one day we will see. All right. That's all we got. 
for this video. So everybody, let me know. Let me know on Twitter and Instagram, um, at Tragos Law, at Lawyer You Know, Facebook, wherever you guys follow us, that you can actually uh, send us messages. Um, if you care about that, you know, river stab trial or the Daybell trial or whatever, I know you guys care about this um, because it's been a case we've been following for so long, so many twists and turns, still so much to unpack and learn from this case. So we'll continue to watch this. We'll continue to follow this. Make sure you guys hit the like button if you haven't already. Helps us out, helps the algorithm, helps it get out to people and make sure you subscribe. We're still growing. We're still adding new voices to the chat, the best chat in YouTube. Um, and the best way we can do that is for you guys to subscribe. Hit the reminder bell so you don't miss future lives and future videos that we do. You guys are literally the best. Uh, thank you so much for coming, hanging out, asking questions, giving your opinion. I know you don't have to do that. And I know you choose to do it here. And I appreciate that. Uh, so until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.